Hello again, everybody. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? So we have this paper. Are we doing this paper? This is the paper. This is the gold standard of the paper that we are to do. Yes. This one is also good that we get to try all different kinds. If you notice, this is the first one on enthalpy change. Yes. So we have done some on different things. Now we do one on enthalpy change. All right, everybody, you can hear me well. Oh, my, my hair looking nice, yes. My TV at the background with some nice cool wallpaper, yes. That's what I call the moods. We are in the moods. We are in the moods. Tomorrow, say, I'll be going back to the office. So today is the last day I can enjoy class from my home. <laughs> yes. Yes. How's everybody's fourth day of Eid going? Today is the fourth day of Eid in most places. I think in, what is it, in Saudi and Dubai, it's already the fifth day, right? It's like two days gone past Eid. A surprisingly thin paper. Uh-huh. I mean, you mean a surprisingly fewer small paper. Thin, thin. I don't think thin is the term we used to refer to how short a paper is. Okay. Well, to, for those, I don't, I don't blame you for those who have exams, they better have, you know, what you call those? One day eats, you know? That's what, what works for you guys. You had exams. Hello. Let's say you're not doing anybody favors. Okay, so. Is there anybody here who was not online yesterday with the paper four class? Generally, I like this year, one trend is there that everybody who's almost taking the paper four is taking the paper five with me. I think the combos worked well for everybody. He's like, you know what? Let's just take both. Why not? Muhammad Ahmed is not here. Sir, how to deal with poor sleep habits? Well, what does it mean by poor sleep habits? Is that the number of hours or the time that you go to sleep at? Okay. Okay, no worries, no worries. Yeah, we just, Muhammad Ahmed, we fixed a couple of classes. We changed the timings for, for because of Eid events and everything. Well, as you sleep for 10 hours, well, you're a growing boy. You can sleep for 10 hours. I think teenagers need 9 to 10 hours of sleep. The myth wrong is everybody needs 7 hours. Till you hit 19, normal is 9 hours of sleep is normal for growing bodies. Your bodies are... Lately, literally growing massively inside internally. So the more you sleep, the better it is. In fact, so five hours is too less, dude. Don't make my mistake. I slept for five hours a day since I was 18 till I was 41. And I tell you, it made me sicker. It made me unhealthier. It made me slower. And I always had a brain fog that I didn't know what it was. Suddenly seven hours of sleep now that I get. It's like a new drug, like, you know, the drug in Limitless, that's the kind of drug it feels like. It's like, whoa, I can see everything. I can feel everything. And all I take is a couple of cups of coffee. I used to drink six cups of coffee before. Six. Dude, guys, you have to have, you have to have nine hours or two, eight hours of sleep. If you do five hours of sleep, you don't realize that, you know, if you don't sleep that much, it's like driving to school, driving and giving everything in a drunken state. So if you sleep five hours or that night before, no matter how panne khan you are, you're going to screw up your paper. It is, it is medically proven. That's why they don't let pilots fly if they haven't slept. That's why they don't have doctors. This is medically proven. You don't want to. So that's, that's, that's stupid, right? You sleep five, five hours. And those two days, you're shitty because you only slept five hours. Then you suddenly sleep 10, 11 hours. Might as well do perfect. You know what? Do eight and a half. You see? Or do seven and a half. At least do seven and a half. Now, yaar. This eight, five hours bullshit. You're only screwing yourself. You think you're helping by studying two extra hours. I guarantee you, you have the same amount of time on your phone as screen time. So, yeah. 
Okay, so let's begin. We've discussed enough sleep. You guys can take my word for it. Not, it's up to you. It's your brains and your body. But take it from a guy who's unhealthy. I know why I was unhealthy. Now I am no longer. Um, but I'm bam. Yeah, afternoon papers, man. You can sleep more if you want. Yeah, sure. Okay. So let's begin, shall we? Shall we? Okay, so the first question in this paper is with zinc and copper sulfate. And zinc and copper sulfate we know undergo a redox reaction where zinc being the more reactive metal displaces copper, the less reactive of the two from copper sulfate, right? And Generally, we do an experiment where we find the enthalpy change of such a reaction. Now, the way this is done in the lab, when if you ever did this in the lab, is that the reaction is not instantaneous. That it's not that right away you're going to have the in maximum increase of temperature. It takes some time, maybe four, five, six minutes, you know, like th at least a minute or two, if not less, if not more, sorry, I meant. So in this case, we take zinc powder. And we add it to a measured volume of a certain concentration of copper sulfate. So we know zinc is in excess, but we live it the copper sulfate in the solution. We have 25 cmq of that. We record the temperature for three minutes. And this is what generally happens. So you take a particular copper sulfate. This is a very common experiment that they've done a lot of times. You take copper sulfate, blue solution, you put a thermometer in there for three minutes. Three minutes, why? So that you can steady the temperature and the temperature of the surroundings and the copper sulfate has become constant. Like here, you see, it was 18 first, but for the first three minutes, it became constant. And then in this region, you added zinc. And then at the four minute mark, add an excess of zinc. And you continuously start the mixture and record the temperature every half a minute after that, you see. Now, if the reaction went instantaneous, then the temperature at the fourth minute would have been the highest. But if you notice something, the temperature in the four and a half minute, which is literally half a minute after adding zinc, because this reaction is exothermic. So the temperature increases, <clears throat> but it keeps increasing, you notice? And it goes to the maximum it reaches is 38 degrees at five minute mark. That shows you for two minutes, the temperature kept increasing. And therefore, the reaction wasn't instantaneous. Now, if it's an instantaneous reaction and instantaneous heat evolved, then the maximum temperature would occur at the four minute mark, not the five minute mark. But the maximum here seems to have occurred at the five minute mark. So I'm now dissecting this without worrying about the question for a second. And I'll talk about a couple of things here. So one was clearly the, it took us at least one minute to reach the highest temperature from when it was added. Second, that yes, the temperature re did reach 38 degrees, but if something is getting hotter over a minute, so you let's say something we know, from the fourth minute to the fifth minute, something is getting hotter, right? So if something is getting hot, hot, it's increasing its temperature, but it's also doing something else. To do with temperature, we'll talk about that. Because if you notice something, after 38, the temperature is starting to decrease. Now, why did the reaction, why did the temperature increase? It was a separate part, so the temperature increase so why did the temperature increase in the first case? Because the reaction was not complete. The reaction was taking place, place, sorry. But then after the 38 degrees, why does the temperature decrease? Why is the temperature decreasing after this? I'm asking you, think about this. Ask yourselves this question. Why does the temperature decrease after 38 degrees? I'm asking you guys, yeah? Nope, Mohammed Ahmed, 
that's okay. So, so now the reaction between zinc and copper sulfate was taking place in the fourth and the fifth minute. And at the fifth and a half minute, the reaction had stopped. But why is the temperature decreasing? Because now something is hot. And there, when something is hot, it loses heat to surroundings. And over time, it eventually becomes room temperature all over again. So the reaction had stopped. I had told you that already. That's not the reason why it's temperature is decreasing. If the reaction has stopped, the temperature should remain constant at 538 degrees centigrade, right? It stopped. It shouldn't increase anymore. But after some time, it starts to decrease because the heat is lost to surroundings, which means whenever something is hot, there is always heat lost to surroundings. So if, if you think about this, how much of heat or how much of temperature is lost in the half a minute between five and five and a half? Now let me erase this also. So the maximum is... Mm -hmm. at 5 is 38 degrees. So what temperature is lost in just a half a minute? You go from 5 to 5 and a half minutes. A whole 2 degrees is lost, right? So at this stage, could you assume approximately that the rate of heat loss to surroundings is 2 degrees per half a minute? Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah. So then I ask you, yes, it's a fair assumption that that it takes half a minute to drop by two degrees. So if I ask you, what is the exact moment at which the whole system starts to lose temperature to surroundings? Think about in terms of the time mark, you see, one minute, two minute, three minute, okay. And then at the four minute mark, you added zinc. So let's say at the four minute mark, you added zinc. And then the four and a half minute, it becomes 32.5 and five and five and a half. So my question is, if you have to guess, predict at what time moment, does the whole apparatus start to lose temperature to the surroundings? What would you say? Um, yes, you guys. <clears throat> yeah, some of you are thinking five, some of you are thinking four and a half. When okay, so forget the time. What does a, what does the system have to have to start losing temperature to surroundings? What temperature does the apparatus have to have to start losing heat to surroundings? Some of you might look at the table and think about it and think, oh well, the highest temperature is thirty-eight. So when unless it reaches the highest temperature, it should not lose heat, right? Not really. Anytime the temperature is greater than surroundings, you will start losing temperature. So when is the temperature at surroundings? At the three minute mark, just at just before adding zinc, it's also room temperature. So the temperature can, so the apparatus starts losing temperature the moment it crosses room temperature. And when do you think the temperature becomes more than room temperature? What is that time do you think the temperature here becomes more than room temperature? It's literally the moment after adding zinc. The moment after adding zinc. So it is literally the four minute mark. Yes, they have no reading here. That doesn't mean just because there is no reading done, that means that's the reaction didn't start or there was no heat. There is heat, but it's a very small amount of heat. It's negligible heat because the reaction is slow. But the moment the reaction starts, given that it's exo, it's going to heat the surrounding. So this question actually is a great way for you to start thinking about the practicality of an enthalpy chain experiment. It's like, you know, 
your stove, when it has to boil water, it's not an instant boiling of water. It takes time. But, but the, once you boil water, is not when the water cools down. The, when you are boiling water, even if the water has not boiled, don't you feel the water letting go of heat above the can? So if you put, imagine this, you have an oven. I just did that. I just made myself some scrambled eggs earlier. But if you were to cook something, right? So you have a stove, you know, let's call this a fire. And then you put water on top, right? So there's a water here. You start heating it. You start heating it, water starts to evaporate because it's getting hot. It might not reach its boiling point, but it's already hot. So while you're heating it, it's also becoming hot from top. And what is heating it in the Bunsen flame or a oven? It's a combustion reaction. So the transference of combustion reaction to conduction takes time. But before it becomes boiled, it's still losing heat. Similarly here, the moment the reaction starts, you know, maybe the four minute mark, just the moment you add it, maybe after a few moments, it became 22 degrees. Who knows? We didn't measure it. But it's literally the few moments after zinc is added is when the temperature should uh, start to decrease. And there is a rate of decrease or heat loss to surroundings. There is a rate of heat loss to surroundings. They will want us to think about that because there is a rate, you see. You already have some sort of a rate. You have three, you have two degrees, one degree, half a degree, one degree, half a degree, you know? You have kind of have a rate. Yes, it's not constant rate, but it's there, right? So here, a few things to remember now. You leave the temperature constant initially to reach a constant temperature before you start the experiment. Because the reaction is slow, the heat evolved will not be instantaneous. Now, it's unlike the, if you had remembered earlier, in your earlier studies, an acid carbonate reaction is exothermic and that is much more instantaneous. You can measure it in the first 10 seconds, you'll get heat evolved. But it won't still be instantaneous, it'll still take 10, 15 seconds. Here it takes a few minutes. And the longer the experiment, the more time you lose, the more temperature you lose to surroundings. So here, heat loss, that's why the graph is done like this. It's actually, if you ever done the lab for this, it's a cooling curve graph, you see? Meaning that there are two graphs. There's, there are actually, there's a, the plot the graph temperatures, extrapolate the cooling curve graph and determine so the temperature change during the reaction. So there is basically draw a line of best fit for cooling. They don't even want the heating. They want the cooling only. This part, five degrees on uh, this part, they have to extrapolate. So a few things again, the temperature, it starts to lose temperature to surroundings at four minutes. You don't stop at five minutes. Four minutes is when it starts to lose temperature. At the same time, it's also increasing temperature. There's a net decrease after five minutes, but there is two things happening. The reaction also happening at four and a half minutes, four minutes and five minutes and heat also being lost to surroundings at four minutes, four and a half, five. It stops rising because the reaction stops. The heat loss to surroundings has already begun at four minutes. So think about this two ways. There are two things that start happening at the four minute mark. mark. The reaction starts and heat loss to surroundings starts. The reaction stops at the five minute mark. But the heat loss of surrounding continues all the way till it eventually becomes 19.5 degrees. All right. That's the crux of this kind of experiment in the first place. Any questions about this so far? Are you following some of it at least? Now, let's start answering the question. Let's, I'm gonna remove all of this stuff so that I can have a clean table again. Okay, cut this out. So it says here, use the results in the table to deduce the graduation on the thermometer. Now here is fun. Remember one thing. You might see, and a lot of you might think that the graduation here is 0.5 degrees. 
nope the readings the readings are always accurate to half the smallest division that is a graduation so what's the smallest reading you could take here if you think about it 0.5 so if 0.5 is the smallest reading what is the smallest division one degree centigrade because the reading is half the smallest division and if the reading is 0.5 that's the error the error is the smallest reading you could take and that's half the smallest division so half of one gives you 0.5 many most people wrote this wrong okay most of the people got this part wrong and that's the case here that you understand this you need to understand that that if your thermometer can record to one degree centigrade you will record readings to half the division and you might say well why is it half the division because what if the temperature is between 31 and 32 degrees let's say the meniscus of the uh, mercury is somewhere between 31 and 32 how would you record that you record that as 31.5 which is what they had done here now if your thermometer had divisions of 0.5 if the divisions were 0.5, what does that mean? That means you'll have a mark for 31 and a mark for 31.5. And then if the meniscus is between those two points, that would be what? That would be 31.25, which basically is half the smallest division. Half the smallest division will be your smallest reading. So you should have had readings in the 0.25s. You don't. You have in the 0.5s, which means your graduations were one degree. All right. Okay. Then we scroll down to plot the whole graph on this case. So, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I could probably plot. Come on. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So the temperature I have to, right? And so I plot all the points. So the zero, one, two, three, four, I should have them in, you know, in front of me right now. Yeah, let me take out the paper. Okay. Oh, there's some part left to this. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. So they want the apparatus. Sorry, let me draw, let me draw the apparatus first and then the graph again. So they want to draw a label diagram of the apparatus set up at the one minute mark. So basically, the, at the one minute mark, you haven't added zinc, right? You're just going to remember. So basically, you have to do the whole experiment. How does, how does one do this whole experiment? Well, you do it in a cup, you know, uh, those polystyrene cups or the, what we call thermopole. But in chemistry, we call them polystyrene cups. So you got to remember that. So it's a polystyrene cup, okay? But generally polystyrene cup it's because it is it is lagged it's an insulated cup we have that standing inside a beaker by the way so basically it's the beaker that it stands inside like that to keep it to keep it fixed in a particular place all right so there's a cup the reason why the cup is in a, put in a beaker because the cup is light. So if they ever ask you, why do you use a glass beaker? To prevent toppling. To prevent toppling of the cup. Because the cup is light. And then there is a liquid inside it. You should also make the liquid inside it, please. There is copper sulfate solution inside. Right? So you put a, you put a level and you say uh, copper sulfate equals and then there's one thing missing also what is missing okay a thermometer the thermometer is somewhere standing in mid-air okay and that's your thermometer and you can say thermometer so thermometer polystyrene club glass beaker that's the kind of things you're looking at okay and this is before adding zinc to the whole apparatus. Okay. The bulb should be within the solution. 
yeah and then we draw the graph okay so now I'm going zoom, um, zoom out again and I uh, will draw my graph so at the zero minute mark it's 18 and a half so I'm going to zoom in again and then okay so the zero minute mark it's 18.5 for 15 16 17 18 18.5 right there you know right there cross and then at the one minute mark is 19.5 so the one minute mark is 19.5 at the two minute mark it's 19.5 at the three minute mark it is 19.5 right right there okay and yeah so 15 16 16 17 18 it's at 18 okay it's at 18 i think i read that wrong okay but we still won't use that because that is constant that is an that point is kind of relevant irrelevant sorry and then we want the time after the four minute mark so that's the only part they really care about we can cross put these points on but if i look at the question it says draw the line line of best fit during cooling cooling only happens at starts at what temperature if i look at my table if you think about the table again this is what i have to draw this table five minute onwards not before that that's the graph i care about because before that the reaction is still increasing temperature so it's 38 at the five minute mark and start from there okay so at the five minute mark which is it has to be 38 right so these are my this is my five minute five minute six no it's not five I think it's five, yeah, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? That's what we have. Yeah, okay. So uh, sorry, you might be confusing when I keep moving this around, but at the five minute mark, what is your temperature? It's 38. So the five minute is 38, 35, 37, 38, right there. So let me delete that now. Now come on, delete. And then 35 and 38 is right there. And then at five and a half is 36. So 35, 36. And then at the sorry, five and a half, five and a half, sorry, five and a half, not six. That was six. Five and a half would be there. My bad. And that's the six minute mark. So no, no, six minute way. It is what? 34. 34. And then six and a half minute, it is. 33 so 33 at the six and a half minute and then at the seventh minute 32 and a half the seventh right here now this is definitely not going to be a straight a straight line of best fit it might be line of best fit but it'll not be a straight line of best fit it looks to me like a curve more than anything else right and that's what it is it's a curved line of best fit and they can be a curved line of best fit so now the seven this is the five and five, five and a half, six, six and a half, seven, or seven and a half. And there's also seven and a half, there's eight. <coughs> At eight, it's 31.5. Right here. And nine, it's 31. And 10 is 31. Okay, so I got my points now. Now I can zoom out to see the whole graph, right? This is my graph. Mm -hmm. And they've already highlighted the four minute line you're supposed to extrapolate this till what time extrapolate till the four minute mark and you know why they're saying four minutes that's when the reaction started and you know what we're doing we are trying to predict what the temperature would have been like at the four minute mark if the reaction was instantaneous that's what they're doing right here literally that's literally what they're doing mm -hmm. Uh, so here, what do we have? So, at, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, we just have to sketch this little here. So now I'll have to probably sketch this out. So that, that is my, curve. That's, that's my rate, right? Okay, no, that's not working out, but that's more like, okay, uh, something like that.
and then it slows down a schooling right there you know something like that yeah there you go that should work and when i extrapolated it what's my what's my temperature it's coming somewhere right there it's maybe you know what 40 41 42 42 and a half let's just say 42.5 that's my degree centigrade yeah approximately at the that's the temperature at the four minute mark and i'm sure they want that and they want the temperature change of the reaction so basically that's for from from what to 45 basically started off from where 19.5 and it went to what 42.5 so what's your delta h that's the thing that's your temperature change so for what is 20 is what 33 30 no, 23 is 23 yeah so temperature is 23.0 degrees okay yep yep it does yep that's what it is so now for those of you still confused about what i've done this is also called a line of best fit the problem is that i don't know in what grade when lines became synonymous with straight lines because this that i'm making is also a line this is also a line this is also a line and this is also a line just that you all assume that a line is a straight line no we don't assume that it's straight unless it's said it is straight yep and the points that they wanted were draw the line of best fit during cooling now you could i forgot to make the delta of 4.5 somewhere but it's an irrelevant point to make it would be somewhere here let's say it's here who gives a shit that will not be counted because that is not the cooling curve so i didn't make it because who cares about that but that's the line of best fit this is called the line of best fit it's a curve and curve is a line of best fit unless they said here draw a straight line of best fit which is highly impossible for this because clearly the points show me it's a curve and that's the common sense that you have to use if the lines don't look like they're a straight line, it must be a curve. A curve is also a line. It's called a straight line and a curved line. That's what it is. Both are lines of best fit. And after doing that, my value at four minutes is, let's say, 42.5. And my starting temperature was this. What was this? Right here. Just before hitting, it was 19.5. And we predicted that the highest temperature could have been 42.5. And so the delta temperature change is 23. This is how we do this kind of question. Okay. This is how, because what we've done is we've extrapolated and found the temperature that is 42.5 that we think would have been the temperature if the reaction was instantaneous. This is the predicted temperature. Predicted highest temperature what that means is that must be the temperature the moment the reaction happened if the reaction was instantaneous okay mm -hmm. all right you don't have to in many cases they also say uh, make uh, extrapolate both lines and then find the delta which is this delta but we didn't have to do that we just did the number they didn't ask us that so i could just directly find the delta and write that here Okay. Mm -hmm. You guys, if you guys are asking questions, you have to ask questions that make sense to me. Three word questions are not something I'm understanding. Ask again. I cannot. <clears throat> I don't know, Saad Salman, if the, depending on your graph, if your graph got you 22 degrees, then they will accept 22 degrees. Yes. <clears throat> I don't understand how I have your question. I really don't understand the question.
for those of you still struggling with where did 42.5 come across let me zoom out to show you that i extrapolated my graph and 42.5 was the reading at the four minute mark you see the four minute mark that was the reading on my graph from there literally that that's where this came from let me highlight that if i had a ruler and a pen that would be easier but that's what it is at the four minute mark the cooling curve was predicting that if the what is what is this 42.5 42.5 is the temperature it would have been at four minutes to match the cooling curve you have made and the reaction did not the reaction stopped at the five minute mark and kept cooling and you know if you give it five more hours it will cool down and down and down to what temperature 19.5 because that is the room temperature so 31 is not the room temperature 31 isn't we not we not want the temperature change of how much it cooled no we are finding out the temperature rise due to the experiment which means the reaction before the experiment the temperature sorry the temperature before the experiment and the highest temperature we are predicting it must have reached because if it was instantaneous we would not need to predict it we would have the instantaneous temperature here we don't because the reaction is slow i started from way earlier in this paper saying that this is a slow reaction if it's a slow reaction some of the heat you have made has already been lost understand this guys the recorded temperature was what highest tell me something look at this the recorded temperature is 38 degrees right we are saying is 42.5 predicted you know why because the reaction was so slow that in the first two minutes there was more heat made that was already lost that you never recorded because it was so slow by the time you recorded it some of the heat was already lost we are using this graph to predict what would have happened if there was no heat loss and that is we are saying is 42.5 that's how we do we you extrapolate from cooling curves to kind of negate the heat loss to surroundings because you use the cooling curve to come here we are saying that even if you measure for because you see remember you measured the highest is 38 we are saying okay all of this region is actually the heat loss to surroundings that we could have never recorded but because we got a cooling curve we could extrapolate and figure that out all right so the temperature rise is from the lowest temperature you start off with to the highest you reach you started off with 19.5 and the highest was 42.5 so the delta is 23.0 for me for some of you it might be 43 minus 19.5 for some of you it might even be 42 or blah 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 so whatever you guys got it'll be they'll use your graph to figure out the answer all right okay this question took long okay have i cleared everybody's answer Hmm. Then let's scroll down. Then they're saying use the formula mm -hmm, to determine the enthalpy change of the reaction. A delta H is minus MC delta. So delta H is minus. Now it's one cm cube is one gram of solution. You gotta use the solution volume, guys. Not the so what is the solution volume? Because that's being not the zinc, but the solution volume is 25 cm cube. It says right there, right? So here, understand that the the mass of solution will be 25 grams. Because they're saying one cm cube is one gram. So minus 25 into they've given you CS4.2. It becomes 4.18 into what into delta t which is delta t was 23 degrees now you might say well bilal that's in degree we want kelvin understand that change of one degree is a change of one kelvin 
but one degree is not one Kelvin, but change is equal because initial minus final will come out to the same value. So I just plug them in and I get a certain value here. What do I get? So in my case, now this is just uh, delta H MC delta theta for this is 25 times 4.18 into 23 is I get 2403.5 joules. They want kilojoules per mole. Now this is not, that means the question is not done yet. This is just the heat, by the way, right? So heat, now divide by a thousand to make it kilojoules, by the way. So this becomes what, how many kilojoules? 2.4035 kilojoules. You want it per mole, but now you want per mole of what? Of the limiting reagent. If zinc was in excess, you want the moles of copper sulfate. How do you get the moles of copper sulfate? Number of moles is concentration into volume because it was a solution, remember? I know, well, so I don't know the concentration. So let's go back and find the concentration. It's 0.5 and 25. So 0 0.5 is the concentration. And 25 over 1000 is the volume. And this will give you the moles of copper sulfate. And this is the part of enthalpy changes done very early on in AS. If you can't remember it, you got to go back and revise that. How do you find delta H per mole? You do it by heat, which is this fellow, which is minus, sorry. So it's minus 2.4035 divided by the number of moles of the limiting reagent in this case so minus 2.4035 divided by my earlier answer i get minus 192 yeah obviously i believe that the temperature rise was supposed to be a little more than what i got in fact which is why my answer is lower than the expected answer so minus 192 but if my delta H was less than 25 degrees, it might be close and closer to the answer. Let me just do that and just check, by the way. Right? So 2.6 divided by 0 0.0125. Yes. Yeah. So the temperature rise was somewhere like, I think they're predicting 25.5 degrees or 26 degrees. That would be close enough to their answer. Minus 23. Yeah. Or I think 25. No, 25, not 25.5. But you know what? The graph would have been better. But this will be marked according to your value. So they already reduced marks for your accuracy. They won't reduce marks here. And that's the answer. So it's negative. Yeah. Delta H is negative. Mohammed Ahmed, acid and I, acid and metal reactions are also not instantaneous. They take time. Like they'll take a few minutes, moments. Acid carbonate. Some are like 30 seconds, 10 seconds. They're okay enough because you don't want to make a cooling curve for 10 seconds. Then it becomes pointless. Hmm. I gave delta H negative, didn't I? Anyways, then there's a heat loss to surrounding is a major source of error in this experiment. Suggest how the following changes could affect the amount of heat loss. Now you might understand that you, understand, you need to also understand heat loss is governed by what? You see, first of all, the greater the delta T, if there's greater delta T, there is greater heat loss. The hotter something is, the faster it loses heat. Now, if I, if I double zinc, most people might think, oh, you are doubling a reactant. The reactant is doubled. And in most cases, you might think, well, if, if a reactant is doubled, reaction will happen more off, right? And you'll produce more heat. The problem is, if you double something that's already in excess, it will not change anything. So there'll be no effect. And you know why there'll be no effect? Because zinc is already in excess. Adding more will not 
cause any more to react. So it's a pointless exercise, that part. Okay. Then they're saying the concentration is doubled. Hmm. Okay. Now, because cause copper sulfate is not in excess. Now it makes sense. So now if you if you're keeping the volume constant and constant and the concentration is doubled, therefore the number of moles will double. So the number of moles will double. Let's write the explanation first. So what you've done is here, you have doubled the amount of copper sulfate in the same volume. You see, if you double the volume also, the doubling the amount won't make a difference. But in the same volume, you have doubled the moles, right? So double the amount in the same volume will produce more heat. And if you produce more heat, what happens to heat loss? Therefore, you know, so greater rate of heat loss. So effect on heat loss will be, it will be an, uh, there is an um, greater heat loss. If you had cooled it, you had you taken less so now, but the problem is guys, you see that there, there's another error at play here that did not ask you, which is that, yes, the heat loss might, you, this will increase heat loss, but it will reduce percentage error of a thermometer. And in the real world, we have to figure out, does the heat loss, is the heat loss greater or the delta, uh, the error in the th reading greater? So in the real world, you might say, Bilal, if the rate of heat loss is so high, what should I do? I shouldn't I just take very low concentration of copper sulfate? And you would be right. If you take very low concentration of copper sulfate, the heat loss will be minimal. But then also the delta T will be minimal, like one to two degrees. And one to two degrees of delta T in a reaction is not enough to give you a healthy low percentage error of the apparatus because it will result in like 10, 20% or something or 100% error. You don't want that. So that's why there's always a balance between how much to take. Okay. Now the third one, this is also very interesting. This is a good question about errors. The volume is doubled. Now you might say, okay, the volume is doubled. And since the volume is number of uh, volume does double the moles, right? So the amount of copper sulfate doubled, right? Heat evolve, increase, increases, but what? The amount is still in excess, right? So you can say the heat evolved doubles. The heat evolved doubles. But the volume is also doubled, right? That's important. But as volume also doubled, this is, this is the fun bit. If the heat doubled and the volume doubled, then as the, uh, so when you double the volume, for the same concentration, you know that the moles double because concentration into volume is number of moles. And if the concentration is kept constant and the volume is doubled, the moles double. If the moles double, the heat evolved will double. But because the volume also doubled, you realize that delta T remains the same. Because now you're producing twice as much heat for twice as much volume and remember delta h is minus mc delta t so if somehow you doubled heat and you doubled mass therefore this will remain constant so there'll be no change no effect or no change in heat loss okay because that because you are the energy is twice and the volume is twice, but the ratio they cancel out because the volume is twice. And that's seems like an easy question, but I'm sure many people must have screwed this one up because 
this chapter this chapter has always been a problem for people to think practically i don't know why but enthalpy changes is always fun to do and i wish there were more marks for this than 10 but that's what we have for this course yeah hmm. all righty then Hmm. Questions? I'm just now going to the next question, right? You guys had a lot of questions in this case. Oh my God! Some of them were like, "Why am I even looking at these questions? What's wrong with you people?" Then I forget that common sense has decreased its commonality. You know, it's no longer as common. It's un. I know you've heard those lame jokes, but it is very true here right now. That it seems to be that it has become extremely rare. I think they were not developed in the first place. Depleting means they have to be first developed to deplete. I think you guys with your junk that you've been consuming for the last four years have caught up to you guys. You guys are blaming COVID, but it's not really COVID. It's the earlier and earlier and earlier use of smartphones. It's not the booster dose has got nothing to do with i also did it i'm not dumber and i old people's brain cells decrease faster than young people's brain cells because you guys are growing you guys have what we call human growth hormones i don't have them anymore i have only one growth hormone it's called fat that's what i'm growing in mm -hmm. so the point being that the addiction of dopamine by cell phone apps is really causing us to not to use our this. I, so have you been studying the same thing forever, aren't you, Haya? I'm not talking about Haya, my smartness in chemistry. I clearly don't judge my smartness in chemistry. I don't judge my smartness as how much chemistry I know. No, 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 no. It's got nothing to do with that. You know, I'm the person who has left two running schools that make billions of rupees profit to do this project online, which seems unreal because nobody else wants to do it for all the subjects and I want to do it and I'm going to make it happen and I'm going to make it successful. And that probably is also a sign of intelligence somewhere, right? Or maybe extreme stupidity, but that's not the point here. The point here is that, um, I uh, know. No, actually, it, there was hardly any chemistry here, Omaima. Uh, paper five is a lot of common sense, less chemistry. The technical chemistry comes in paper four. And actually, how much you understand academic material is a sign of IQ, by the way. I don't know if you guys know this. Since we're not talking about EQ, we're talking about IQ, intelligence. It is also how fast you understand scientific material. The world has decided that term, not me. Hello. I think that's the only judgment we also need in the right now in the world, right? I mean, well, how about you not give exams, right? And then you can straighten out the standards. Yeah, there's always been a hierarchy because the world works on hierarchy. These days, the hierarchy is intelligence and exam grades. Find yourself something else, right? First hierarchies used to be how close you are in the family tree to the king. Thankfully, that's not the case these days, is it? So I'd, give, I'd, I'd sacrifice that for this, you know? I don't know. I mean, until we find something else, maybe the standards of hierarchy should be how cute is somebody, right? I don't know. Or how much body fat they have, I don't know, I mean, there has to be some and these days the capitalistic world has decided that it must be based on your skills if you were communist maybe in uh, russia ussr earlier on it might be how loyal are you to the communist party but since we are all studying in a capitalist system trying to do a degree i don't think you guys are all doing a levels just because it feels nice or it looks good no you're doing it because you want to go to college and you want to go to college mostly because you want to have a job really most of you or find other reasons to go to school right but i mean 
I didn't make these standards, guys. I didn't. I'm just saying. My premise was, and I don't know why I'm doing this over Zoom for everybody also, is that guys, much smarter people than you and me design these apps that keep you addicted and keep you dumb. When we are dumb, we just keep buying shit that they sell and we keep working more and more to buy shit more and more. There's, we work a lot more. We work 50 years of our life to do this. To, just so that we can buy more shit. You know? Anyways, so don't use apps so many times. Yeah, that's what I would say. Can you go to the next question? It is the matrix, Carl. I tell you, it is the matrix. People don't believe me. People don't, but it is. Boom. Opa. Okay, can we do the next question? Next question. Next. In a interesting class of sorts. Now we got the next question. Okay, what is the next question? I don't understand. Okay, you watched a video about this. Okay, great. Repeat question. Okay, I have not seen this question before. Now, question number two of this paper is about ethane dioxide acid being a white solid and potassium hydroxide is added to ethane dioxide acid and the neutralization reaction is place place. Okay, so the acid reacts with two potassium hydroxides to do that. Now, if a small amount of potassium hydroxide acid, partial neutralization takes place and not all the H plus ions are replaced by K plus. Instead, an acid salt forms which crystallizes to form K, this, 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 this. Okay. The letters A, B, and C represent a ratio of the number of species present in the compound and may not necessarily be whole numbers. Okay, then. And the relative number of water molecules associated with one formula of the compound is represented by D. Okay. So that's okay. A student attempts to determine the values of K. Okay. So it needs to know. Because initially it was what, if you remember, right? So this fellow C2O4 is two minus, K is one plus, H is one plus, and they wanna know how much of K do I have, how much of H plus do I have, how many of the ethane diet I have, and how much of water I have, oh my God. So the student, okay, so let's start this question. The student wants to make a 250 cm cube solution of a certain crystal. Let's call it A. A student adds a certain grams into a beaker. That part they've already done. Describe the next steps. The student adds 1.89 grams into a 100 be gram beaker. Step number one, add about, let's say, 50 cm cube of what? What do you add here? Distilled water. This is them making a standard solution. Distilled water to the crystals in the beaker and stir. Then what do you do? Transfer the solution to a 250 cm cube volumetric flask. And this is, we've done this enough times. This is standard. This is how to make a standard solution, right? Transfer this, okay? Then add more distilled water to the beaker and transfer the washings into the volumetric flask. Okay. And once you transfer the volumetric flask, both the initial volume and some more rinse washing, then you do is you top up uh, the uh, volumetric flask solution.
to the 250 cm cube mark with what with distilled water and then you cork and shake if you want to the volumetric flask but that part is ex extra you know, nobody cares about that so those are the parts so one of the mark was for using 250 cmq volumetric flask one was to dissolve the solid in the beaker then the third mark was to transfer to the beaker and also the washings and the fourth mark was to top up to the 250 cmq mark with distilled water those are the four things okay the the most common omission was rinsing of the beaker and adding the washings to the volumetric flask this this is missed out you know so this has been missed out by most people don't do that okay so the best answers have that also add more distilled water to the beaker rinse uh, or rinse and transfer the washings to the volumetric flask that's what they wanted all right yep 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 I'm glad you remember my gold reference. I'm my gold. I'm my gold. One second. Mm hmm okay so what's up next let's do this part can i get some water can i get some water can i get some water hi guys when does class end okay i have another class starting once at three o'clock shit okay i got 20 minutes left to do this 20 minutes left to do this mm -hmm. okay Then the next part says, determine the number of moles of uh, ethane dioid. Now, I believe that's done by using KMN4 here. Okay. So we do the parts of each with different experiments. So ethane dioid are found using KMN4. And so KMN4 is deep purple in color. And all of the species appear colorless. The reaction takes place above 70 degrees. That's important. We keep heating it. So student rinses a burette with KMN4. It transfers A into a conical flask, adds excess acid, then is heated to a temperature of about 80, and then he adds KMnO4 until the end point. And he repeats the temperature uh, experiment until he has concordant results. So if you notice the rough is 25.05, and then it looks like the iteration one and three are the ones that are the concordant results. So the student determines the average title to be 24.4. Okay, that's fine. When emptying the pipette in step two, the student touches the surface of the solution with the tip of the pipette. Now this is, okay, this is a very practical approach. So when you empty out a pipette, there are few drops left inside. It's like a straw. If you ever drink from a straw and you stop drinking, there's some liquid left in the straw. Pipette works like that. In the real world, you might say, let's blow into the straw. But that would also introduce your spit in a solution that you're doing for experiment in chemistry. So we don't do that. Okay. So what we do is, so uh, why why what we do is we ensure, you know, that the record. So what we do here, it's not ensure is not the right word. Okay. So to transfer the uh, remaining drops on the pipette now why would you want to put the remaining drops because the remaining drops are also part 25 cm cube so that exactly exactly 25 cm cube have been transferred that's what we do this for all right guys Okay, and then 
the most appropriate apparatus to measure 20 cm cube that's in excess that's in excess you don't need a buret what would work when you have excess liquids to be measured out the easiest fastest way is using a measuring cylinder and if you ever done this lab in the lab you would have used a measuring cylinder for this okay now these are fun questions by the way very practical questions suggest why the students start a titration after at point one and the reason for that is that the solution is the buret solution is very deep purple you see that and you would never know when it's starting but because it's, because if you put deep purple solution in a buret you will not see divisions see so you won't be able to see the 0, 0.00 mark as the manganate is deep purple so you can't see that that's the problem see so won't be able to see the 0, 0 mark yes but you might say well the same problem we have with the 0 0.1 well, the 0 0.1 would not be that big of a problem because this is what's going to happen in the buret. You see, so there will be the 0 mark and the 1 mark. And then you'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, that. And if the part below it is dark, you can still guess the part below it because you can see the top part. You can see this now. That's how you know the next one is 0 0.0, uh, 0 0.10 because you see the 0. But if it was at 0, you would not see anything. That's why you never start a KMNO4 titration from the zero mark. You start from 0 0.1. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in titrations, what does it mean to have concordant readings? It means to have two titrations or two. You got to have two tighter readings here within what? 0 0.10 cm cube difference. So they are 0 point within of each other. Actually, yeah, within uh, of each other. And that's what we want. In every titration, we want the two readings to be within point 0.1. If they're exactly the same, they're also within point 0.1 here. All right? Done? I'm going to scroll down now. Hmm? Then it says, state the color that you will see in the conical flask. So at the end point. Now, before the end point, when you keep dropping KM04, it's still colorless. Because when his reaction takes place, you have less KMnO4 and more of the other guy, and it'll always stay colorless. The end point means you have one extra drop of KMnO4, which will be pale pink. Just a drop of KMnO4 will be pale pink or pale pale purple. Sorry, it'll be purple, not pink. So you can you can call it pink. You call it pink, or it'll be very light purple, which looks like pink. That's the end point. Mm -hmm. Now, these are these, this this is this question is a very good question to start understanding what happens in a titration. I'm loving this question. Like people, like what the examiner put saying, people do not realize that you know in a in a pipette is designed in such a way that it still has one or two drops extra. You don't remove those drops. You don't blow them out, but tipping them removes exactly 25 cm cube. So when you ever fill a pipette of 25 cm cube, it generally fills it up. The mark means 25.10. But when you let it out and you touch the side walls or the solution, a few drops will still stay inside. Those drops will be the extra two drops. And what will come out, it'll be exactly 25 cm cube. Also, people have, this part tells me that most people might never have done a came in a four titration. And whenever you do a KMNO4 titration, I actually don't even start from 0.1. I just tell my students to start from 1.0 cm cube. 
anything below zero. So as you can see where that is. And we generally take the upper meniscus for dark solutions. But whichever meniscus you take, you take both starting and final as the same. So the delta, is, uh, the error cancels out. And so these are some, some of the, and sometimes people don't know the color change for KMNO4. They think KMNO4 is a redu reducing agent and that goes purple to colorless. That's the case when the reaction takes place, hence it's purple to colorless. But the end point is no more reaction, which becomes permanent pink. We call it the first instance of permanent blink. Pink, basically, blink need pink. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we use the mold. Uh, so, okay, so now calculate, determine the number of moles in 250 cm cube. Okay. Oh, they have determined the number of moles in this by using the titration. Okay, that's a long calculation. If you notice, the ratio is 2 is to 5. So, you're going to use that. And the 24.4 of, of 0 0.202 dm cube. So basically, what's my data points? That KMNO4 was concentration was 0 0.02. Titer volume is 24.4, right? 24.40, yeah. And the ratio is 2 is to 5. So first, I'll find the number of moles of KMNO4, which is what volume? Concentration is 0 0.02, volume is 24.4 over 1000. This will give you the number of moles of KMNO4. So 24.4 into 0.02 divided by 1000. That gives you 4.88 times 10 to the power of minus 4 moles. This is the moles of KMNO4 that reacted in the conical flask. And so the ratio of manganate to what was that? C2O4 is 2 coefficient is to 5 in the view. In the, the equation coefficient of 2 is to 5. And the moles of manganate that in every titer, the average titer was this. And you'll find the moles of thiosulfate, as uh, so ethane diode. So this into 5 divided by 2 gives you. So the number of moles of C2O4 2 minus are 1.22 times 10 power of 20 minus 3 moles. But this are, these are in 25 cm cube because the reaction took place in 25 cm cube. So how much will be in 250? So number of moles of C2O4 2 minus in 250 guys would be how much? Would be 10 times this. Which is 0 0.0122. That's what I get. Yeah. That's the number of moles of C2O4. Then if you're unable to calculate, okay, fine, that. The student does an acid-base test uh, later to determine the values of A and B in this. Suggest a suitable reagent to use for this titration. Since as H plus ions, you can use NaOH, KOH, right? The lab, can, lab has NaOH. So name, oh, I can't use the formula, I'll reduce the marks. So I've got to say, Aqueous sodium hydroxide. They tricked me here. They said name. So I've got to give the name. Okay. I can't use the formula, please. Okay. Okay. And the student finds the concentration of H plus ions in solution A is this. Okay. What is solution A? Oh, solution A is 250 cm cubed. So now. These are the moles in solution A of C2O42 minus. Then we have the concentration. So let's find the moles of H plus ions in A. So H plus in A. Let's find that out. Number of moles is concentration of volume. Concentration, they just gave me 6.10 times 10 power minus 2. And how much volume is A? 250 cm cube. They've done the whole math for me already. I just have to do this. This is literally what I have to do. How much is this? Okay. So this comes out to uh, 6.1 times 10 power minus 2 down to 250 divided by 1000 is 0 0.01525 moles. Now I have the moles of H plus and C2O4. Okay. 
Hmm, interesting. So I don't have K here, but I do have H plus now. So I have, let's find the H plus and the C2O4 2 minus ratios. You might say, well, how would I find the ratios? Well, I already have the value for H plus, 0 0.1525. Was the moles, this is, by the way, in A. So in A, how much of C2O4 2 minus did I have? 0 0.0122. So then this is going to give me the ratio of C is to B, right? C to B is 1. So mm, C to B. So C is, oh, okay. So this is C. And they want the C to be 1. You notice that C to B, C to be 1. So this is my C and this is my B. And I want this to be 1 is to something. So let's find that 1 is to what? So cross multiply, you get what? So you get 0 0.01525 divided by 0 0.0122. I get 1.25. So 1 is to 1.25 is what I get. Interesting. Yeah. So now if I have, hmm, C is to B ratio is 1 is to 1.25. Okay. So what that means is this. If I have one of this, so let's let's write it down. So K, I do not know. But if I have one of C2042 minus one of this, yeah, and I have 1.25 of H. And the charge for C2042 is 2 minus. And both of these are 1 plus each. So I equate the charges to get the charge of the value for A. I've got to equate the charges here. So for example, What's the plus charge? Well, it's A into 1 plus 1.25 into 1. That is the plus charge. That also should equal to the minus charge. Or the minus charge, basically, or the sum of the minus charge should equal to 0. The net charge should be 0. So this is the charge of K plus, H plus, and C2O42 minus. All of them should equal to 0. So what do I get? A plus 1.25 minus 2 equals to 0. So A minus 0.75 equals to 0. So what's A equals to then? 0.75. Beautiful. Oh, beautiful question. I love this. Oh my God. I'm just too excited by this right now. Let's finish this question. I have a start class starting in five minutes, right? So I'm just going to scroll down now. Now, okay, so now there's more math involved here. Okay, now we've got to find D. Okay, interesting. So now I already know my formula. K is 0 0.75, H is 1.25, and I have C2O4, right? Dot DH2O. Okay, that's what I have. Okay, and then they want the mass of one mole of this. Use your answer to B part 4 and C part 1. Okay. B part 4. B part 4 and C part. So I know already the ratio from C part 2. And the actual moles of the whole thing. Hmm. What am I doing? This? So here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they want the mass of one mole of this. Okay, that's strange. How do I find the mass? Hmm, <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, you know what I have? I forgot. So I have been told that the moles of the guy that is one is this one, you see? So the moles of C2O4, the actual moles in A. So in A, the number of moles of C2O4 to minus were how much? 0 0.0122 moles and that's the whole thing so this whole thing is also one mole you see one of that so therefore the number of moles of the whole crystal in a are the same 0 0.0122 moles okay but if you remember we made this from what what was the mass of the crystals i know you already have the mass if you go back, when we made the whole app solution, we had taken how much mass? 
right here. 1.89. So you already have that. So I'm going to scroll down here and go to 1.89. So the mass is 1.89 grams. So how do I find the MR? Number of moles is mass over molar mass, right? So the number of moles are 0 0.0122. Mass is 1.89 and then I find the molar mass. Cross multiply. So 1.89 divided by 0 0.0122 is 154.9. So that's my mass of one mole. And then I need to find the value for D. Well, that's pretty easy because now I know that K is 0 0.75. So 39.1 is 0 0.75. Then 1.25 into 1. That's gone. That's fine. And then 1, 2 oxycarbons. That's 24. And 4 oxygens. That's 16 into 4. All of that plus D times 18. That's for water. All of that equals to 154.9. The individual mass is equal to that. So you have something, something, something plus 18D, right? So basically 39.1 into 0.75 plus 1.25. That just that gives you how much? Okay. 30.575. So 30.57 plus 24 plus 16 times 4 is 64, right? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Okay, 30.5 plus 24 plus 64. That gets me 118. Sorry now. Point. What's my D? Uh, oh, no. No, it's not 100. What am I doing? I think there's something wrong here. It's not 100 and anything. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. So I'll do this all over again. This is crazy. So 0.75 into 39.1. Plus 1.25 plus 24 plus 64. That equals, all of this equals 118.575 plus 18D is equal to 154.9. So this minus 154.9, you get 36 divided by 18. You get 2, I think, yes, 2.01. So the D is two point what is it? Uh huh. Two point zero one something. So the D is two. There you go. Yeah. And that's what we have here. And there's one last part right here. Okay. So that part is here. This is the fun question because you need to understand that the if the and one somebody is probably wondering this. I mean, because so basically, when your formula is zero point seven four five and H1.25 and C2O4 dot DH2O. When this is mixed in water, it'll give me 0.75 moles of K plus, 1.25 moles of H plus, one mole of C2O4 two minus, and now we know two moles of water. This is once we mix it in water, right? So one mole of C2O4 two minus is also the same as this. The ratio between C2O4 and the whole crystal is 1 is to 1. So once I found the moles of C2O4, they were the moles of the whole crystal. Not waters, but the whole crystal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's confusing and I can't help it. Some of you do not know moles and if you don't know moles, you are going to struggle for chemistry all your life. That's the reality of it. I can't make moles any more easier than I at this stage in life. You got screwed. You didn't do moles well. And now you're going to suffer. You just wish there's less moles in your paper. This is class 10 moles, by the way. There's not even anything moles. There's no more moles here than what you've ever studied before in your life. It's the same moles. At the end, it's saying a student uses another method to determine D. They are heated to remove water molecules. Okay. So construct a table to know the reading. So they're only actually, basically, you want uh, the multiple readings. You want an empty crucible. So because then you know how much to add. So you do a mass of empty crucible that you will only use as a scale. Then you say mass of crucible plus what? The crystals in grams right and then you say 
क्रिस्टल्स बिफोर हीटिंग सॉरी क्रिस्टल्स बिफोर हीटिंग ओके एंड देन यू कैन डू मास ऑफ क्रूसिबल प्लस सॉलिड आफ्टर हीटिंग because it's no longer a crystal but you can write crystals also and then you make a table like this three rows like that and then you're going to have like that yeah you should write slash grams there are marks for the slash grams part slash grams slash grams okay yeah mm -hmm. now this is basically then there's another thing for mass to crucible plus solid after reheating because remember you reheat till constant mass to get the final so that's the last bit you'd make here and i'm sorry my table looks a little dirty but i got to wrap this up fast now so yeah that wraps up the question yeah i got to start the next class guys all right see you guys later next class is a regular time no more changes that's just first time change okay i got to go see ya bye bye okay